My name's Mike Kanjan, and I'm one of the pastors here at Chapel Bay, where you can come as you are and hopefully leave like you've never been because of an encounter with Jesus. That's our hope, that you will have an encounter with Jesus. Uh, a lot going on today. We've got a baptism. We've got, um, uh, we've got an anointing afterwards. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, but before that, uh, w- ladies, our women's re- one-day women's retreat is for November 4th. Uh, we hope you'll sign up for it and that um, we know that you'll be blessed if you come to it. Uh, it, was, it was overwhelmingly profound last year. We know it will be the same again this year. Uh, we celebrate with uh, uh, Pete and Sarah Bates. Their son, Chris, got uh, engaged to Jordan Lawrence this past week. I, last I heard, they were in Ireland, but um, we're just really excited for the family and uh, for Chris and, and Jordan. Really great stuff. In fact, why don't you give them a hand just in case they're worshiping with us. As I mentioned, uh, we have an anointing in the, uh, it's going to be in the band room, the school band room, uh, following the service to the elders and their wives and any who are joining uh, the Rain family. um, It will be in the band room, which is behind me across the hall. And then last but not least, if you notice, our, our baptismal has been reduced to a bowl. And there's a reason for that. It kind of kills two birds with one stone. Many of you have asked, where is the cross? Well, the cross that has been our cross for 30-something years broke. Uh, It was being moved, and it just fell apart, as things do. Uh, But it is being repaired, and it and the baptismal are being stained into the color of this table. So they're all being refinished. They'll all be here in a few weeks, hopefully by the beginning of fall. And that's what uh, is the mystery behind the cross as well as the baptismal, and of course, we know the water's the thing, not the the furniture itself. So uh, prepare your hearts for worship. Uh, We're glad that you're here. We welcome you to Chapelgate in Christ's name. Would you stand and sing this first song with us? This is Praise to the Lord.
adore Him. All that have life and breath come now with praises before. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good.
You all can have a seat. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Passarelli. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we have the joy of baptizing uh, another one of our babies. So I'm going to invite Joe and Sarah Hernandez, along with their son Jamie, uh, to come on up. Um, and I know you all have a lot of family and friends here, so we are glad that you all are here as well. Um, so I got to know Sarah when she was part of the young adults group here at Chapelgate. And I knew Joe as Joey, uh, the guy she was dating up in New Jersey. And then uh, at some point, uh, he moved down here. I got to know Joe as well. Uh, got to do their wedding a few years ago. And now uh, get to baptize Jamie. So this is really exciting, you guys. Um, you know, baptism is a sign that we are a part of God's family. Uh, in the Old Testament, God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision uh, to show that Abraham's children were a part of God's family. They were a part of the promises that God made. Uh, and it showed that they, they weren't walking the walk of faith alone. They were part of this whole community. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled God's promise to be God to us and to our children after us. And so today we get to give Jamie that sign. And part of it is a reminder to Sarah and Joe, that you guys don't walk this path alone. You don't raise Jamie alone. You do it as a part of this family of God here at Chapelgate. And we're so excited to get to, to be a part of that with you all. So I have some questions for you all. And I forgot to mention Rich, but Rich came up anyway. I'm glad you remembered Rich. Uh, Rich Thomas is one of our elders. And he's going to have, uh, after I have questions for Sarah and Joe, um, he'll have some qu a question or a, a statement for the congregation for us to affirm our commitment to, uh, to Jamie. So... Uh, these, are, these are for you, Joe and Sarah. Do you acknowledge, uh, I'm going to use...
days, days in new places. Finally, we pray to you regarding the wildfires in Hawaii. Please comfort the people who have lost their homes, their friends, their businesses. Give wisdom to firefighters as they battle the fire and give wisdom to government leaders and people as they care for the displaced and brokenhearted. Now, Lord, we, we pray as you taught your disciples, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Several times each month, we have been taking a moment to profess our faith as a congregation. So would you stand with us as we read these words together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning, Chapelgate. Good to see you all. Um, my name is Nicholas. I'm a Chapelgate Church member and also a Chapelgate Christian Academy alumni. Uh, it was wonderful to greet you this morning as well as read scripture with you. Uh, today I'll be reading Mark 7, 14 to 23. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going to into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled, thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immortality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting and wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Tim Bashner. I am the uh, director of middle school ministry and young adults ministries here at Chapelgate, uh, and it's a privilege uh, to bring such a fun passage to you all this morning. Um, really cheers the mood up. Um, this morning we continue to, to look at Mark, and this, this passage kind of builds on our passage from last week that Rob preached on. Uh, Jesus is, he's addressing a group of Pharisees uh, who have attempted to kind of build up the law, uh, build up the law in a, in a way where they can uh, actually complete the law and fulfill God's law. And, and these Pharisees have been so hyper-focused on following the law that they often miss Jesus. This morning, our uh, passage, Jesus uh, is confronting another attempt to be righteous. Uh, his, his reasoning is, is a little different. Uh, last week, Rob talked about how we don't measure up. Uh, but Jesus, in his teaching on, on what defiles us, addresses what actually causes us to fall short. If you can't measure up, if, if how you are living does not measure up to the law of God, the next question becomes what causes you to not measure up? Jesus' words are external things do not make you spiritually unclean. It's your own heart. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for what it reveals in our own hearts. God, I just pray that you be with us this morning, that your gospel message is proclaimed. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. When I was an uh, undergrad student at Liberty University, uh, I remember sitting in a theology class. I uh, don't remember a lot of my classes, but this one stuck out to me uh, because the professor uh, was, was talking about confronting sin and confessing sin, and he brought up a famous televangelist who had been exposed for sexual immorality. He showed the video of this preacher con confronting uh, or talking about this to his church, and uh, the, the video starts out innocent. The man, uh, the man pleads for forgiveness but then it quickly turned into a blame game. He, he began to express how powerful the devil was, especially to the, the people like him who preached the word of God. And what, what started out as a confession of sin quickly became a blame shift to the devil. An attempt to win his congregation over, he appealed to the power of the devil he was under which only minimized his own accountability. Ironically, earlier this summer uh, when I preached, I preached on uh, Jesus casting out demons out of a man. Uh, and 
the, the, the same thing is true, uh, is still true, that, that Jesus is the one in control. He is the one that is uh, powerful over evil. But, but what Jesus is addressing here is, is that evil actually starts in our hearts. This is uh, the same message that we get in the Sermon of the Mount where uh, Jesus says that, that if, you lo- if you look lustfully or if you hate in your heart, it is to commit adultery or murder. Our sin problem starts within us. Last year, I was a part of a program uh, that required that I, I go to conferences every quarter. Uh, at every conference, they would present a business idea and a theological, biblical uh, topic. And uh, this particular conference, they were, they were talking marketing as the, as the business topic. And this consulting group, this marketing consulting group comes and they present their idea of how uh, they market uh, medical, medical medicines and technologies. And they posed this question that stuck out to me. They said, where is the only place in the world that people offer their unfiltered thoughts and questions. People chimed in, they had different ideas, but all fell short. Because whether it was your best friend, whether it was your family, or someone or somewhere else, every place you would go, you would filter your own message based on how you thought the person would respond. The the presenter did have one idea, a place where you offer your true unfiltered thoughts. Their answer was Google. (laughs) To Google, people will ask questions that they're unwilling to ask anybody else because there's, there's a secrecy to it. Google protects us from sharing our true motives, our true desires, our true thoughts with the people around us. These these marketing firms make money based on selling their findings of what people are asking Google to help companies uh, market their products to what people are actually asking, not what they think people are asking. Jeremiah 17 talks about the heart being deceitful above all else, and that it is desperately corrupt. Our hearts even deceive ourselves. But our passage this morning reminds us that bent towards evil our hearts defile us. See, our, our tendency is, is to believe that if we can just project a sense of holiness or righteousness, and, and if we can just hide our sinful desires, then we don't actually need Jesus. We don't want to believe that, that we're capable of the, the terrible sins that we see other people committing. And, and in the church, it's, it's so easy for us to project an a exterior uh, of, of doing all the right things so that we can trick ourselves into believing that we have it all together and never actually be, tra- be challenged on what our true desires of our hearts are. See, it's, it's not the external things around us that make us too messed up and not measure up. It is actually the, the desires and, and the outflow of our own hearts that defile us. It's, it's also not in, in us correcting our own hearts that save us, but it's the gracious gift of Jesus. Your sinful heart makes you sinful. Jesus has, he's, he's come to this group of Pharisees, and he's left them with this message that uh, they probably didn't really understand. Uh, we know this because the disciples didn't understand it either. They had to ask Jesus for more clarification. Jesus elaborates No food can defile you because the sinful sinful desires of your heart have already defiled you. Most likely, uh, Mark's anecdotal comment that he makes that that Jesus is here declaring all food clean uh, was more of a commentary than an immediate implication. Uh, We know this because in Acts, this is still an issue in the church of whether uh, food is clean or unclean, uh, whether the kosher laws are still in effect. Uh, just, just as the Pharisees were called out for honoring God with their lips but not their hearts, 
The desire to follow the food purity laws shows an overemphasis on an outward appearance rather than an inward obedience. See, Jesus can't just be upset with them trying to follow these food laws. These food laws were were given by God. But what Jesus is, is doing here is he's confronting people who are so worried about being externally clean that they fail to address their own hearts. This is what legalism does. It it convinces us that if we just have the right outward appearance figured out, that we don't have to confront our own hearts. This is where we find ourselves. This This is why we manage to avoid the big sins that we feel like actually separate us from God. This is why we compare ourselves to to one another and say, at least I'm not as bad at following God's law as that other person. If I can just do these things, then, then I will be all right. We must be confronted with the fact that we are what makes us sinful. It's not a matter of circumstance. It's not a matter of temptation and the devil but deep inside us, our hearts lead us astray and lead us longing for evil in this world. This is what James 1 says. Uh, James 1 says that, that God does not uh, tempt you, but we are tempted, lured, and enticed by our own desires. It's easy to see evil around us, but sometimes we blind ourselves, forgetting that evil comes from within us as well. Do you want to live in communion with your Savior? Are you willing to admit that your sins, that your mess-ups, that, that, that your own failures flow out of your own sinful heart? See, it's, it's actually when, when we recognize our sin and we recognize our own need for, for Jesus that that's actually where we meet Jesus. It's, it's when we recognize our need that Jesus meets us. Consider what your heart's desires are. Our hearts take things that are good and it twists them for evil because our hearts are bent towards evil. It takes the help of a trusted community to understand our own heart's desires, to help us see how our hearts bend towards evil and how we twist what we love and we twist what we would desire for evil. We need to examine both our own hearts and we also need other people to help us examine our own hearts to remind us of the gospel message. Because a view of our own sin actually pushes us to reliance in Jesus. Our passage makes the point that it's not external things around us. And, and to some degree, I'm sure this is hard for the disciples to hear. Right? For, for thousands of years, the Jewish people have been operating as these things as law of what makes them spiritually clean. But Jesus' point here is, is like saying that you don't need to be ceremonially unclean by eating food that is unclean because you are already unclean. You have already messed up before you could even make the decision whether to eat or to not eat. Or like last week, to wash your hands or to not wash your hands. Your heart has defiled you because living in a sinful world, a world that sin has infiltrated and continues the pain, your heart leans evil. Paul Tripp in his his book on sex and money makes the profound remark that no one wakes up and decides to have an affair today. You in your right mind do not wake up and decide to do any of the sinful desires listed at the end of this passage. No one wakes up and decides today is the day they're going to murder someone or decides to commit adultery. But left to itself, left in sinful desires, The heart bends towards evil. 
Because over time, the heart that is bent towards sin, left to itself, corrupts. Our hearts lean towards hate. Our hearts lean towards pride and self-promotion. And at the expense of others, our hearts lean towards lust. If our heart's natural bend is, is evil and evil thoughts, then, then we actually need a Savior outside of ourselves to deliver us from this evil. If, if your heart is naturally bent towards sin, it takes something outside of our own hearts to produce fruit, to be seen as righteous. And, and this is also where, where Scripture takes us. It takes us outside of ourselves. It takes us outside of our sin-bent hearts to the cross where Jesus rights our wrongs. When we believe we can do it on our own, when we make faith about a list of rules, rather than Jesus, we shift into believing that our hearts can be good enough on their own. That is where we, that if we work hard enough, we can prove our righteousness. <clears throat> Uh, one of my favorite movies is Christopher Nolan's uh, last Batman movie, The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, in the movie, Anne Hathaway plays, plays Catwoman, or Selina Kyle. Uh, Catwoman has an extensive criminal record. Her main objective in the movie is, is to find this device that she's heard about that would erase her criminal record from every database in the world the device they call the clean slate. She has heard about this device called the clean slate, and she's actually been offered this clean slate. A group of criminals have, have offered to give her the clean slate in exchange for Bruce Wayne's identity uh, so that they could steal his financial treasures, Bruce Wayne being Batman. She makes a deal with these criminals so that the beginning of the movie kicks off with her stealing Bruce Wayne's identity, stealing all of his money. And then when she goes to collect this clean slate from these criminals, they laugh in her face and tell her no such device exists. Until the end of the movie, where she helps Batman restore Gotham City, she is given the clean slate by Batman, by Bruce Wayne, the very person that she robbed. See, when, when we fail to see our own failures, and when we attempt to earn salvation on our own, and we, we, try, to earn, uh, we try to earn our own place with God, we rob Jesus of what he made us for. When we fail to see the, the brokenness, the failings, and the mess-ups of our own hearts, we miss our need for Jesus. We miss our need for, for the only person who's able to actually declare us righteous. The only person who can take our defiled, messed-up, dirty hearts and to declare them holy. This morning, Jesus invites you to recognize your defilement to recognize the dirtiness of your heart, to recognize the place where you fall short, not, not for the sake of, of beating you up, not for the sake of believing that nothing good can come from you, but, but for the sake of drawing you closer to himself. This morning, you are invited to, to find your righteousness, your cleanliness in the gift of Jesus. You invited to give up the, the tireless burden of trying to measure up yourself, believing you have any chance on your own. You are invited to love your Savior that you so often rob. In Jesus, we have a Savior who is both capable and loving enough to take himself to the place of death so that our hearts can be reshaped in the gospel. Patrick Allen, in his uh, discipleship work here, talks about ministering to the heart. Uh, part of how we learn to understand the gospel is, is through reshaping our thoughts, our feelings, and our desires. This takes both recognizing where our hearts are now and also where the gospel has called us. 
I love the uh, picture that Paul gives us in Colossians 2, 16 through 17. He's talking on legalism and asceticism there, and he says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you for questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, because these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. See, when we lose sight of what Jesus has done for us, when, when we make our faith about, about guarding ourselves from anything that can defile us, when we fail to see our own failings, our sinfulness, we rob Jesus of what he takes joy in. We place our faith in, in the things that are designed to be a shadow. When, when a shadow is simply just something that signifies something greater, we rob Jesus of the restoration and the forgiveness that we receive when we confess and repent of our sins. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, puts it this way. We tend to think that when we approach Jesus for help in our need and mercy amid our sins, we somehow detract from him, lessen him, impoverish him. To put it another way around, when we hold back, lurking in the shadows, fearful and failing, we miss out not only on our increased comfort, but on Christ's increased comfort. He lives for this. This is what he loves to do. His joy and our joy rise together and fall together. In a moment, we get to celebrate and take the Lord's Supper together, which is a constant reminder that, that our hearts are sinful, our, our desires are sinful, and, and left to ourselves, we had no shot at staying clean. But Jesus, but Jesus took on flesh. He made himself to be sin who knew no sin so that we can experience righteousness with God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel, that, that in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of our, our sin-bent hearts, you have come, you have given us a savior, and you have redeemed us. God, we just uh, thank you for your word, and we pray this all in your name. Amen. And thanks for that reminder that in Jesus, uh, not only is our slate wiped clean, but we have all his riches given to us. That is a beautiful picture. And that's what this table is about. It is the reminder, the assurance to us that our slate has been wiped clean and that everything that was Jesus's has been given to us, the entire riches of heaven, as we are made children of God. Long before there was Google inviting you to come as you are, Jesus gave this table inviting us to come as we are. So if you have put your faith in Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, then you are invited to take this bread and this cup. But if you have not put your faith in him, then please do not take the bread and the cup and instead consider that invitation to come as you are and receive him in faith. We confess together our sins because that is the common place where we all stand together. Let's pray together. Father, we confess what you already know to be true. Our hearts, our hearts are, are divided, divided. Our, our thoughts are corrupt, our actions betray the faith we confess. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Give us pure hearts, true thoughts, and the will to put our faith into practice by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take a moment to quietly reflect before we go to the table together.
on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Paul says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. Father, as we take this now, we ask that this bread and this cup would be for us the body and blood of Jesus, that you would be present with us as we take. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I'd invite you now to take the bread and eat because this is the body of Christ given for you. I invite you now to take the cup and know that this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink from it, all of you. Father, as we go into our week, we ask that this reminder would go with us as well, that your spirit would empower us to live as followers of Jesus who know that our slates are clean, that our lives are yours, and that all you have has been given to us because of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Would you stand and sing this last song with us?
good for us to be together and to worship God. It is also good for us to be sent out by him into our world. As you go, know that Jesus has given all for you so that all he has can be yours. Your slate is clean. Go in that confidence. If you need somebody to pray with you, if God has convicted you this morning, if you just need to to share a burden with someone and ask them to bring it to the Lord, there are people here to pray with you. Come, let them pray. You don't even have to say anything. Just let them carry your burden to the Father. If you're online with us, type a comment in the line, uh, in in the chat, and someone will pray for you. Uh, We'd love to do that. Receive now God's blessing as you go into your week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in that peace to love and serve the world. Amen.